Well, for the past three weeks, we've been turning fear upside down here at Chapel Roswell. And I'm not talking about like the fear you can generate when you hide around the corner from somebody and jump out and scare them or the fear that we experience watching a movie or a TV show, although you might recognize our video theme and backdrop from a well-known sort of scary show that's out and coming out with a new season. Um, By the way, I just want to say, can we appreciate the folks on the worship design team and the work that they do? Will you help me appreciate them? And fear is a powerful motivator. Uh, It has an effect on us um, that goes right down to the core of who we are. And and it can be helpful. A healthy and appropriate sense of fear promotes survival. But fear also has a shadow side, and, and sometimes we can be overcome or overwhelmed by fear, and it can motivate us to think or talk or act in ways that are unhealthy and unholy, cause us to do things that aren't good. And so we're taking up the topic of fear, and we've been dealing with fear from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, We're turning fear upside down in terms of our fear of God, our fear of failure, and our fear of death. You know, I, I would make the argument that fear, I think, is a factor in our cultural and political divide that we don't seem to be able to escape right now. You know, the fear of the other. The fear that something is different, something will change. And I think it's fear that then leads to a lack of trust. And I think we're struggling with that right now here in our nation, in our community. I mean, I even heard it bubble up when our team was getting ready to go to Russia this past summer. We got questions about the decision to make that trip. Are you sure you want to go over there? Are you not worried or concerned? And you know, maybe we did have a little bit of concern. It's uncertain, going a long way away from home, never been there before. Yeah, you hear stuff and you read stuff in the news. And... But man, when we got there, the people that we met and that we spent time with were warm and loving and gracious, which I think teaches us something. It taught me something. Is that, you know, even in the midst of a cultural discourse that seems to be fueled sometimes by fear and lack of trust and fear of the other, man, when you get boots on the ground with people, people are people. And we all want the same things in life and are working our way there together. And so that's why we're taking some time to turn fear upside down. And we started with the fear of God. And we read in 1 John where it says that when we intentionally live and remain in love, in the love of God, when that is our place, and that is the place from which we approach the world, then God's love is perfected in us. And perfect love casts out all fear so that we don't have to be afraid of God's wrath or God's punishment, but we can be motivated by the love of God. And then last week we dealt with the fear of failure and read specifically from one of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, who was writing to the nation of Israel about their failure collectively. And acknowledged a few important things to know, like when it comes to failure, sometimes it's not about accomplishing a thing. It's, it's about the faith and the willingness to try, to do something for the kingdom of God. 
And it's about failing forward, right? Gaining from it, learning from it, seeing where God is in it. And knowing that God is here and God is on the way. So that we don't have to be afraid of failing. But we can be who God created us to be. Step up, speak up, and trust God. And if you missed either one of those, they're on our podcast or on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to go back and catch them, or you may even want to refer somebody to them. But this week, we're going to wrap up with the fear of death. Something that we all deal with, think about, in one way, shape, or form, at one time or another. And I'll tell you, dealing with death is something that comes with my job, with my profession. I It's one of the things I do is I spend time with people on the death of a loved one, a family member, or when they're approaching their own death. In fact, I spent uh, a semester when I was in seminary as a chaplain at Erlanger Hospital up in Chattanooga. I was doing my seminary long distance I went to Asbury up in Kentucky, but was at a church in Dalton, Georgia. And so I spent a semester as a chaplain at Erlanger, as one of the chaplains on the rotation and on call. And so um, we had the pager, the chaplain, because we used pagers. And, um, and so, you know, we did a rotation and we spent time there, uh, taking turns, taking the overnight shift, and responded to any call that came in, any code. Um, and, and Erlanger is a big hospital. I mean, it has an oncology, it has ICU, it has NICU, the neonatal intensive care, um, obviously maternity. It was a level one trauma center. So any of the traumatic injuries that happened around the region came into Erlanger. I, and in the course of a semester, I saw all of it. Anything and everything it feels like that you could imagine dealing with came into that hospital, and, and I responded as a chaplain in one way or another. And so it put me with death on a pretty regular basis. And we all deal with it. We all think about it, face it. And I don't know if you've ever been to a funeral, but one of the scriptures that often gets read at a funeral uh, it comes from John chapter 14. It's Jesus speaking to his disciples about death and particularly what happens when we die and what would happen when they died. And so that's the scripture that I want to read for you today. It comes from uh, John chapter 14, and I'm going to read f- the first four verses, verses 1 through 4, and then the last verse of that chapter, chapter 27. So this is John 14, 1 through 4. In verse 27, and we're going to put it up on the screen. This is what it said. These are the words of Jesus. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. And then verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I give to you not as the world gives. Don't be troubled or afraid. And when we come to addressing the fear of death and dying, we can take from the example of Jesus helpful ways to think about and approach death. The first one is acknowledging our mortality because in that conversation, Jesus has said to his disciples, I'm about to be arrested and put to death. I'm going to die. And by the way, at some point you'll die too. But let me tell you about what's coming. And it's just the simple fact that Jesus addressed his mortality, their mortality with his disciples, that's helpful for us, informative. Because I think so much of the problem today with touchy, difficult, scary subjects is we just don't talk about them. 
right? We opt for the unhealthy approaches of pretending they don't exist or to worry and stress about them all by ourselves. When in fact, death is a natural part of life. No one escapes it. And so Jesus took up the topic with his disciples of his death and ultimately theirs. One of the ways that was helpful for me to address my own mortality, yes, was spending that time in Erlanger and as a chaplain and, and being with people and with their families at the time of death or dying gave me cause and opportunity to just reflect on my own life and my own mortality and the mortality of those around me. Another way that was helpful for me was when Jessica and I, after we'd gotten married and we had a child and we had a second child and I was the first church I ever served up there in Dalton, uh, one of the members of the church who was an attorney came to me and said, Eric, do you have a will? And we were still kind of new to this whole adulting thing. We had... Um, that's not really something you think about, right, in your 20s, um, is having a will and um, a durable power of attorney and those kind of things. And so I, I said, Steve, no, we, we, we don't have that. What do you know that we don't know? Why are you asking me this today after I just preached? Um, but so we made an appointment with Steve, and, and Jessica and I went and sat down with him, and we drew up a will. And man, that was odd to, to just sit there for a minute and think about what happens when I'm gone, you know? And like I said, we also did like the, the power of attorney, and the, there's, now there's an advanced directive. And so I, I highly recommend that worthwhile practice. If you haven't done it or haven't done it lately, to look at things like that, your, your will, advanced directive. Um, because when we're willing to talk about and acknowledge our own mortality, then we can be prepared for it and plan for it. I read um, a quote from a commencement address that Steve Jobs gave to the graduating class at uh, Stanford back in 2005. I don't know if you ever do that stuff, go and watch commencement addresses or, or read about them. There's, I mean, you get some of the greatest thinkers and leaders and um, humorists. But in 2005, uh, this was Steve Jobs speaking to the graduating class at Stanford. And this was about a year or so after he'd been diagnosed with cancer. He said, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You're already naked. There's no reason not to follow your heart. So I was in 2005, two years later, we got the first iPhone. And four years after that, you know, Steve Jobs ultimately died as a result of his cancer. But man, there's, there's power in those words. Everything else falls away in the face of our death so that we can know and understand and consider and focus on what's really important, what matters in this life. You know, a good, another good helpful practice for me in acknowledging and being aware of my own mortality and our mort mortality is I go to funerals. Not random funerals. That, that's not... <laughs> I know that sounded wrong, but not just, I don't just show up. But who's this? Um, no, I mean, people that I know or people that I've known or in my family, you know what I mean? 
I think there's something important and powerful about going to the funeral. It's a way that we honor the deceased. We, we celebrate their life. It's also a way that we're reminded of our faith and that we put our trust in a God who's bigger than life and death. And that's the other thing that Jesus taught his disciples in that moment when he said those words that we read just a little bit ago. As he said, trust in God and trust also in me. In dealing with and addressing our fear of death and dying, not only is it important to acknowledge our mortality and to be comfortable with it, because the more that we talk about something, the more that we address it and address it openly, the less scary it becomes. But, but also just as important then is what Jesus said is to trust God with our living and with our dying. Because Jesus said, you can trust in God and trust in me. I'm going ahead of you to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house where there's plenty of room. If it wasn't true, I wouldn't have told it to you. So don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. And he said, if I'm going to prepare a place for you, won't I return and come get you and take you there with me? And by the way, part there of uh, John 14 that I didn't read, and I mean, you should go read it. Because part of what I didn't read is the interaction that he has with Thomas. Because Thomas pipes up right there and says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. (laughs) Okay, you're talking about your death and our death. Shaky ground to begin with. This is my paraphrase. But, But he says, you said that we know where you're going and we know the way to get there. Thomas says, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, lo- I so greatly appreciate Thomas. He's also the disciple who, after the resurrection, was the one that said, I don't know if this guy's really back from the dead, because that death's pretty final. He's the one that, I have to put my finger in the nail holes. That guy, Thomas, gets called doubting Thomas. I don't know how much he's doubting and how much he's just a practical person. It's like, okay, I'd, you lost me. And he basically says that to Jesus. How, how do we, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And this is when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You do know the way. It's Jesus. The way to life experienced in its fullest. The way to facing death and dying without fear, with confidence, And faith is Jesus. He told Thomas and he's telling us. He's the way. Jesus told his disciples over and over again, follow me. My life, my example, my teachings. Let this be the way you live. And as the way of Jesus guides our days, day by day, and our steps, step by step, and we're intently focused on living a life the way that Jesus lived, the way that God created us to live, we find there's little room for fear. Jesus said, I am the way, follow me. And then he told him, I give you peace. I give you my peace. The peace of God. The peace that transcends time and space and history and culture, life and death. Peace. In our living and in our dying Peace. And Jesus said, this is my gift to you. 
And he said, I don't give like the world gives. I don't know about you, but that resonates for me. Because how do we experience things being given to us most often in the world? Given with strings, conditions, expectations. Given strategically for gain. (laughs) Jesus said, this is not how I give. I give you my peace freely, abundantly, openly, lavishly, overwhelmingly, beyond what we could even fathom or understand or explain. Jesus said, I give you my peace and I am the way. So that in our living and in our dying, we can have peace, the peace of God. And as I think about that for myself, reflect on what that means for me to face life and death with the peace of God, I'll tell you an image that comes to mind for me is my relationship with my children, particularly at their youngest. I got two now that have sort of outgrown the habit, but all of my kids at some point in their life, it's been a regular practice for them to come and hold me or let me hold them, either sitting in my lap or just jump up in my arms. I mean, if something good has happened and they're excited, come running, give me a hug. Or if I'm sitting, come running, jump up in my lap. Something bad has happened and they're sad, come running and give me a hug or jump up in my lap. And I've made it a habit to tell them, you'll always be my daughter, you'll always be my son. I've got you and I'm always here for you, no matter what, no matter how old you get, no matter how far away you go. I've got you. And I like to think that maybe I've instilled in my kids that sense that no matter what, in the good or in the bad, in the living and in the dying, they can always come running, jump up in my lap or in my arms and know that I've got them. This is the image that I have when God says to us through Jesus, I've got you. And I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I have told you that I've gone to prepare a place for you, then know that I'll come back to you, for you, and take you there. So you don't have to be afraid. And you can have peace. My peace. And it is with the peace of God that we can live unafraid, die unafraid, and love unafraid. This morning, we're going to share in the communion meal. In fact, today is World Communion Sunday, which essentially means that churches all over the world of all different kinds, denominations, have set aside this first Sunday in October to say we'll all share communion today. It was an effort at solidarity, unity, peace among all people everywhere. Pretty timely for us to do this right now. I think about our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico, Florida, Texas, all over the world who may be coming to the table just like we are today. 
And sharing in this meal is, in a sense, sharing in the life and death of Jesus. It's sharing in Jesus' victory over sin and death. It's sharing in the new life that he's offered us. When Jesus shared this meal with his disciples, it was the same night that he told them, said to them the words that we just read. That same night they shared in the Passover meal. And he took the bread and he broke it. And he told them, this is my body. Broken for you. Take it and eat it. And every time you do, remember me. Jesus said, I'll die. But I won't die in vain. My death will be for you and for everyone. Everywhere. That you could have life. And then he took the cup. And he gave thanks and he said, this is my blood. It will be poured out for you and for everyone, for the forgiveness of sins, so that you can be free to live unafraid. Take it and drink it, and every time you do, remember me. And so that's what we're doing today. We're receiving the body and blood of Jesus, the bread and the juice. We're participating in his victory over death. We're sharing in the gift of new life that he's given us. And so in just a minute, we'll set up some stations around the room. And you'll have the opportunity to come and receive communion yourself. I want to ask the folks that are going to help serve if they'll come forward now. And as they come, I just want to tell you a couple of things real quick. First of all. We have an open communion table, which means it's here for you and for anybody. You don't have to be a member of this church or any church to share in communion. We just invite you to come looking for Christ. Come to receive the gift of victory over death, the gift of life. We also receive communion by intinction, which means there'll be somebody with bread and somebody with juice right in front of your section or up in your balcony. They'll break off a piece of the bread and hand it to you. You dip it in the cup, and in that way you can receive the body and blood of Christ. We'll have a gluten-free station as well that'll be back here by this pillar. And so if if that is something that you require or would like, there'll be gluten-free communion back there. And also, I want to let you know that as we're sharing in the communion meal, we'll be singing our last song, and we'll also be giving back our offering, our tithe. And so this will be the time for you, if you've brought something to give or you want to give, to further the work of God's church here in Roswell, to continue to spread the good news that we can face life and death unafraid. These are the ways that you can give. They're up on the screen before you. And I also want to let you know that if you want to give specifically to the relief effort that is going on through the United Methodist Church for the victims of the flooding that is happening all over America, you can do that by designating your gift for UMCOR, U-M-C-O-R. Just just give and, and put on the memo or make the note UMCOR and it'll go to that effort. We also have buckets, orange buckets that are on the floor right up here if you've got something you want to give and put in that bucket. Just know that all of that will go to help bring relief to our brothers and sisters who are suffering. So before we share in this meal, I want to ask if we could pray a blessing over it. Will you pray with me? And, you know, as we're praying, we'd be mindful of
the words of Jesus to his friends, his followers, to you and me, dealing with our fear of death, that to acknowledge our mortality, to be open about it, to address it, is healthy and freeing. And that in that, we put our trust and our faith in God. That God has us, holding us in loving arms, in our living and in our dying. And that God has prepared a place for us, that our death is not the end, it's a crossing over into something wonderful, brilliant and beautiful, that is the house of God. So that in Christ, we face death unafraid. Oh God, this is our prayer. We are your people, your sons and daughters. God, would you give us the courage and the faith to face every day of life unafraid. That we wouldn't be motivated by fear, but motivated by love, your love, so that we could live and love unafraid. God, we're thankful for this gift of bread and juice. We ask you to make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That we could be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. God, fill us to overflowing with your spirit as we share in this meal together. And this is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen.